welcome to a Celtic State of Mind Wednesday bulletin. My name's Kevin Graham and as usual I'm joined by Colin and Brian. We've got a, a full room today. Um, I just want to thank everybody who's currently watching at, the, at this precise moment in time. Uh, sorry, I'm just having a bit... Oh, it's Twitter, it's went off again. I actually <laughs> did, I didn't I didn't think the broadcast had actually started there, eh? Uh, but it was, all, it was Twitter that's gave me the message there, eh? Um, I'm sure Paul's in the background trying to sort that at the moment. Aye, so welcome everybody. I just want to thank everybody that's watching at the, at the moment. Uh, I know that we're all busy people, and here at the channel we're always thankful that you spend time either watching us live on catch up or listen to the podcast later on. Um, so if you subscribe, um, give us a thumbs up. I'm usually in the comments telling people to give us a thumbs up. So give us a thumbs up just now, and and we'll move and we'll go on. Eh, Brian and, and Colin, this is the first time you've been on since uh, Betty Old passed away. So I'll come to Colin first. Betty was always a, a visitor to the Greenock CSC. Um, so what's your memories of Bertie Old? Oh, where do you start, eh? I think everybody's got a, a great story to tell about about Bertie and his time at their, their clubs or their, their CSCs. And, um, uh, we're no different down here in Greenock. Bertie was a, a regular um, down here. He was down that many times. I think he had his own corner. Um, he, he's such a gentleman, an absolute gentleman. He's one of those ones that... And Jerry McDade, who hosts a lot of the events in Greenock, put up a fantastic story about him. He said that he was in a rush. It was just, it was the week that Celtic were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Lisbon. And Betty was wanted all over the place, but made sure that he had time to come down to Greenock. But he could only stay for half an hour. So he comes down and Jerry says, well, do you know what? We'll have a quick Q&A just for everybody. Just any questions you've got, ask Betty and we'll try and get as many answered as possible. So the first question comes in, who was your favourite player to play alongside Betty? Betty takes a mic, 45 minutes later he's still answering the same question. <laughs> That's the kind of guy that Betty Old was. Um, and he's just an absolute gentleman. Any time I was in his company, he was so kind. Um, and he had the stories to tell. He had. He just loved to wind people up. And it, you can tell by the outpour and the grief that's came from this, how much we're going to miss someone like that. Uh, and he is one of those ones that, when that news got announced on Sunday, I, I was absolutely devastated. It felt as if he'd lost a member of your family when he'd passed away. And we don't get characters like that nowadays. Anybody that's putting on a Celtic jersey should look up to guys like Betty Old and say, in 50 years' time, that's exactly the way I want to be revered. And... Uh, I'm still. I'm, I don't have the words to describe how it feels that he's not here with us anymore. Brian, what's your memories of Betty Old? Yeah, it's one of those interesting things. I think Colin touched on it there. Just character. It's 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 not just a, a loss to football. It's a loss to society in a way because you just don't get men like him anymore. He really was a cut above. I, don't, I met him twice. First time I met him through work, and. Um, I was starstruck. Now, I don't get starstruck. I've met loads of footballers, loads of people over the years. And I was so starstruck, I forgot his name. And I was very excited to the team. <laughs> how you doing? He's like, how you doing? Someone, blah, blah, blah. And I was, and I was going, where's, where's, he, where's, his, where's his name? I couldn't remember. So then my boss was there. And he says, right, introduce me, son. Come on. So he obviously clocked it. And I says, and he came to me. And I says, oh, this is Mr. Old. And he went, who are you calling old? <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, Bertie, son, Bertie, come on now. And I was like, oh, listen, I'm Brian, pleasure to meet He's like, no, pleasure's all mine. And he just stood chatting. And he was there for, must be, I thought he was, he was with his son, and his son was desperate to, to go with something to be. And again, he just kept chatting away about Celtic, about life. Um, I said to my, my granddad, OG, he was a big fan of yours and stuff. And, and he just, he was so complimentary and, and just a, a real top character. And um, I, I'm sure if you said some of the jokes and some of the stories, but and if it's been said before, I apologise, but one of my favourites was um, he was doing autographs and signing messages for people and there was a guy kind of hanging about and he says, all right, son, do you want me to do a wee message for you? And the guy says, oh, no, no, sorry, I'm a Rangers fan. He says, don't, don't worry, son, I won't date joined up. <laughs> 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 Just, uh, 
just a, just a talk, and, and I think you see, as Colin says, I'm sure all people feel the same. It's when anything like this happens, it it kind of you think of your own family, you think of your own relatives that went through something similar, and and the the positive about it, I suppose, is that it always reinforces the fact that no matter who we are, rich or poor, black or white, everybody's the same. Everybody's got the same weaknesses, the same flaws, and the same good points, and um, you know we're all the same. We all feel lost, we all feel grief, but the difference is Betty will be remembered for, for generations to come, and I think that's the best thing you can say. It will be. He, he felt like everybody's favourite grander, eh? That was, yeah. the kind of, that, that was the kind of vibe that you got from him. Michael, uh, Karen comes in here, Colin. You're in Greenup, Colin. My sister lives in the building with the windows. You might need to... Uh, uh, is this something that happens in Greenock that you've got buildings with no windows? No, <laughs> no, there's there's plenty of windows. I'm looking out one right now. Um, you just get bars on it. Aye, probably. Uh, let, us, let us know what building you're referring to. Drop us a, drop us a message. Aye. I, just, I thought that was maybe a well-known landmark in Greenock or something I like know. that. I'm just like... Yeah. I tell you what, it was announced <laughs> yesterday, Kevin, that Greenock is going for city status. We are moving Ooh. up in the world. We are moving up in the world. You better get central heating installed first. <laughs> ah, we'll still get outdoor toilets, but we'll get her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. The, today's tagline, and we'll come back to Betty later on, because what something Brian says uh, got me... Got me there's a link to Dan Postacoglu press conference that we're going to speak about as well, but... At the moment, the Celtic AGM is currently ongoing. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of questions getting asked in this AGM. So people in the comments, if you like to keep us up to date, I know Colin and Brian have kind of got one eye on it. I haven't because I've got to keep one eye on news and one eye on the comments and make sure Twitter fails, which it has once again. <laughs> uh, so um, so Dom- Dominic Mackay's exit, as far as I'm aware at the moment, Mr Mackay's exit hasn't been mentioned at all. Uh, at the AGM and Colin you says that um, Mr or what's his name uh, M- Michael Nicholson is was announced as Celtic CEO he wasn't announced as he wasn't presented as acting CEO he was announced as the CEO yeah that was an interesting one there's been some um, really interesting output coming out of the meeting already so far uh, as you said, Michael Nicholson referred to as the CEO, not the acting CEO. Whether that's just a slip of the tongue on Celtic's behalf or not, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but the one that I think we have to discuss in quite a bit of detail here, or maybe the two that's been uh, discussed in, in quite a bit of detail, is the fact that within the room there was strong opposition to both Ian Bankier and Brian Wilson's reappointment. And that means that both of those have had to go to a poll so, I mean, the likelihood is when you look at the votes and the way they're set up that they will get both reappointed onto the board. But the fact that you see the unanimous disapproval from the fans in the room, that has to go a long way to show the Celtic board that, that people are not happy with the people that are running this club. I must admit, Brian, um, I was at a supporters forum uh, earlier on this year and Brian Wilson's did annoy me <laughs> during that supporters forum with, with, with his, one of his comments regarding season tickets and stuff like that. Having Bank here, no love shown for them in the room is no surprise to me whatsoever. No, absolutely not. I think it's pretty reflective of how Celtic fans have felt, not just last season, but for, for a number of years. And to be honest, it, I remember when um, Ange and was first announced and it was uh, Bankier, Dom and Ange. And Bankier looked like he couldn't be bothered, they looked like they didn't want to be there. There's just a, there's always felt like a, a sort of, no a disgust, but it looked like he never really cared too much and wanted to be involved with the fans. It was almost a, an effort for him to do anything. And I don't know, I think it's a, as Colin says it may, when it goes to a poll it may still go through, but I think it's really, really important that these things came up that him and that the opposition towards him and Brian Wilson were were quite evident because it shows that this isn't something that people are fed up about and then we'll just go on me. It's something that's not going to go away. And Celtic fans have been <coughs> sorry, Celtic fans have been strong in their opposition to a, a few things which I dare say we'll talk about and and I'm, I, I like the fact that, you know, it's sort of shown. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Colin, what Brian says there is right. I actually love the fact that it got into the room for the yeah. AGM, that the it's not just the wider support, the outside support, the shareholders sitting in that room have went there and stuck up their hands and says, we are not too happy with, with those men representing Celtic Football Club. And for me, that's a little bit of a breakthrough after a number of years when nothing happens in the AGM. I think what you've noticed over the last few years, and you've got to give credit to the Celtic Trust for this as well, is people are starting to take responsibility as fans and they are standing up for what they believe in and they're finding that there is a way through the political system that is Celtic to make their voices heard. Um, I know there was a lot that the sort of um, the trust worked on and getting people to uh, put their proxy votes in uh, and vote against this, but you've got, as you say, Kevin, the people in the room and going by the updates, um, and I'm getting the updates from the Celtic Underground here, that in the room, it was 90% against Ian Bankier's appointment in the room and 75% against Brian Wilson's. That is a strong indication from the fan base that they've had enough. And do you know what? As you said, they probably will go through on the likes of the the kind of the poll that will be held later on today. The world, but yes. if you are Brian Wilson or Ian Bankier, if you've got any sort of conscience or any sort of concern for the football club, you're looking at it and you're going, I'm not wanted here. But mm-hmm. They won't, they'll continue on regardless. Well, will they show any sort of sense of knowing, knowing no, Brian? Eh? The, Celt- the Celtic PLC are not very good at reading the room, and that's been proved over the last number of years. Yeah, it seems to be a, there's always been a, a lack of self awareness amongst them. Um, but as, as Colin says, maybe, maybe this is the joint where they say, Do you know what? If it's going to affect shareholders, if it's going to, you know, might have bigger ramifications if it's got into the room, which for the first time, and I don't know how many James that's happened, maybe that's time where they go, maybe this is a good opportunity to, to sort of move away. Um, we don't know. It, it's hard to see, but I think we spoke about it before. I always think they should be changed at top level fairly regularly anyway. I think I think any business, you know, five, six years, you know, there should be a bit of a turnover. I think you, you need to get a bit of diversity in there. Not just a you know gender or colour, but diversity of thought, um, and it's been time for a change for for quite a while. So maybe this is the the starting pistol on a bit of change. Let's hope so. But um, yeah, overly trust them to make the call ourselves. I would be sceptical. Um, you, you are quite right. Hopefully, this is a start of change. Maybe even internal change because. Colin, it is quite difficult to get a change of owner and who would be attracted to buying Celtic Football Club is always a worry to me. You see what's happened in Newcastle with the sports washing in Newcastle, Man City and, and stuff like that. And there's always been something that's been in the back of my mind. If we ended up being going to the English Premiership or a European League, we would be a perfect vehicle for one of these rich oil gaps or, or states to come in and actually buy just because of the worldwide support and natural brand that they're getting right away. Um, so it's all, for me, I'm always a bit doubting, going maybe sometimes it's the better the devil that you know. But we do need change, and that change has to get, has to get pushed internally if we're not going to get a new owner coming in. It's the point that Brian was making there. It's, it's just stale. It is so stale. Like you look at it and... You had a, a chief executive there that was there for the best part of 20 years. You don't get that in any other corporation. And that's what Celtic is in its essence, is as a corporation. That hurts to say because we're a, a football club and everybody knows the history of the football club and what it stands for. But in this day and age, we are a sort of corporation. And if you're going to run a corporation properly, you don't have somebody in charge for 20 years. You, you mix it up, you rotate it, you bring in fresh ideas, you bring in fresh people to the table. We brought someone in and he lasted three months. Mm-hmm. He lasted three months. That, for me, says a lot to the fact of the board were not ready for this implementing of change. And the fact that it's came out in the, the AGM today and it was said that Peter Lowell had a lot of influence in the appointment of Ange Postacoglu, absolutely going against everything that was said when uh, Ange Postacoglu was brought into the club about how there was a lot of influence from Don Mackay. He knew what that market was like. He'd been out there with the the rugby, the the Japanese and the Australian market. He knew it. To then come out and say, 
it was actually Peter Lawwell who had a, a strong influence in it. And we can understand that because Lawwell's got his connections with the City Group. We've spoke at length how the connection comes in there with Ange. But to change the story, I, I really hope, one, it doesn't mean that we'll soon see the reintroduction of Peter Lawwell into the day-to-day running a Celtic football club because that would be a massive slap in the face to the Celtic support. But two, how can you trust what words are coming out now? When they're saying, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, if you come out three months later and backtrack on it, how are you going to get Celtic fans to buy into what you're saying? There was an error. We, we said at the time, I think, and when Don McKay left, it wasn't that there was a bit of shock, but it wasn't about John Don McKay himself as a human being, it was what he represented, what that, you know, he represented new ideas and a new attitude and new communication, and they did the fancy it. And that was that was dangerous. That was a worry at the time. And as you say, the, I noticed that as well today with the, the Peter Wall thing. And they, they Celtic done it as well when when he first left and they spoke about all personal reasons. And then it was it came out later that oh no, he wasn't up to the job or the face was not fancied and stuff. So it was a bare face lie. And obviously, Mackay's under an NDA, I would imagine, so you won't know the truth. But it, it, I, I think they're insulting fans' intelligence for doing things like this. Because it's not as if people won't remember that this was Andrew's a Don McKay appointment. Mm-hmm. And the other side was Peter Lowell all along. Is that a Scooby Doo villain? Do you know what I mean? He takes off his mask, it was Peter Lowell all along. And <laughs> you're worried that he's going to come back and, and do something similar. Cause I, I think it's very like, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Peter Lowell's chairman within the next couple of years. Because I feel like he's not leaving his influence as he left the club. And I'm not demonising Peter, but. The fact is, we need to move on. We need to evolve, and you can't do that. It was the same people at the helm. I think there's a massive problem here, Brian, and just uh, that's news to me. I hadn't heard that story this morning about Peter Wall being involved in the appointment of Ange Postecoglou. That as Colin rightly flags up, the flag is in the Man City, is the City Group, and because that's that's the simple flag there. That's a simple connection. Um, so. Tony Aiken comes in, he retired with great din- dignity. He was instrumental in the identification and appointment of Ange and he put his heart and soul into the club. So wow. that was the, that was the exact words that were said. Wow. I'm taken aback with that and I'm unsure how you actually feel about that, actually getting that sprung on me there. <laughs> so... Um, I'm a surprised, probably not. I'm, I'm probably not surprised because, as I was saying, there seems to be a massive vacuum when, when Peter Wall walked out the door. There seems to be a lot of guys who Peter maybe done their jobs and when they were asked to do their jobs themselves just went up to it because Peter's style of micromanaging was very demanding. They covered up a lot of things. But we'll keep the AGM... Any, anything else that comes in for the AGM, just just let us know. Let us know in the comments, and I'm sure the boys will let us let us know as well. Especially when the guy comes in who's always at every AGM and complains about the temperature of the water in the toilets in the main stand. I want to know when he comes in and asks that question because because he, <laughs> he asks that question every single year. It's either the temperature of the pies or the temperature of the water in the main stand that yeah. Oh, the Wi Fi. The Wi-Fi, aye. Well, <laughs> my daughter would want the Wi-Fi question answered. Why is the Wi-Fi rotten? Um, so we'll Look, move on. And we've Kev, sorry, just before we move on, I, I, I want to bring this up because it's in our, our title here. Um, it's just been confirmed that the question was asked to the board about the potential appointment of Bernard Higgins. And the response that came back was, they cannot comment on an ongoing recruitment process, which was roundly booed by everybody in the room. Um, health and safety at big arenas is a massive issue and involves the interaction with government agencies. It's not about policing fans. See, a, a simple denial stops all this, eh? A simple denial go, he's no in for the job, actually stops all this rumour, counter-rumour and protest. They're no willing to do it and you can make it that what you will, which is means... He's in the room. <laughs> he the, is, fact he is being, they, the fact they acknowledge it when they say that, the fact they actually mention it's no policing fans, knowing that that was his remit. So they're very aware of it, you know, what's been asked. Just give a straight answer. You know, even if they mm-hmm. want to hire him, just say, well, look, we feel he's the best man for the job. We get the background. That's not applicable here. And try and explain it. 
But don't don't hide in a corner and, and put your hood up and deny it's all happening when you know fine well, you know, what's going on. As you say, Kev, just say no. Just say, Aye. don't worry about anything, that's not a factor. Or say yes. They don't... Uh, that fluff annoys me. Sorry, but that winds me up. No, it's, not for the it, 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 it's just corporate rubbish, Colin, eh? It's just, it's just uh, corporate rubbish. I, I, I don't get how a club can be so blind to the, the fans' direct opposition of this. It's as if the board are just sitting there with their fingers in the ear going, blah, 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 I can't hear you, don't know what's been said. They don't don't even notice the tennis balls on the park. They don't notice the, the banners in the stadium. They're going to work on, is what Brian says, what they think is the best man for the job. And if they come to the idea that Bernard Higgins is the best man for the job, there will be... Uh, I don't even know what there'll be. It will be a horrendous atmosphere around Celtic Park and beyond. But there you go, they've already tried to move the goalposts. It's not the day with policing the fans, it's the day with something else. He's not coming in to police the fans. You're going, well, no, the job that he's coming in to do, we presumed was head of security. And the, and the, the worst head- bit of it is he has policed fans before. So whether he's here to police the fans now or he's not, the fact that if it comes round to it, they're going to look for someone when they are going to be placing the fans who's got that experience and when you're having someone as toxic as that person in the environment, in the building, how can that be a benefit to our football club? It and, can't. And, and let's widen this out, Colin. It wasn't just Celtic fans who didn't like it. It was all football yeah. fans who actually yeah. criminalised. So One of the things we spoke about earlier, we spoke about you know guys like Betty Olga, we only speak about Angela having character and understanding the type of person that should be involved with Celtic Football Club. This guy isn't the type of person that should be involved with Celtic Football Club or any football club. He just shouldn't be. And the fact is, even as a business, even if you take the, 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 sort of the personal aspect of it out, the opinions of it out, the fact is, if you're a business, as Celtic want to be at corporate level, right, and your customer base, i.e. the fans, are so against an appointment, why would you have the arrogance and the hubris to say, we know better, we are putting them in anyway? It's bad. It's bad customer management at any business level. Never mind football, and never mind the Celtic support that have been so vocal for so long about the type of club we are and what we oppose. And Higgins is is almost becoming an embodiment of that sort of um, separation between fan and board. Now he's he's become the linchpin of it when you look at it, the personification of it. And as Colin says, it's going to be horrendous, a horrendous decision at club corporate in PR level if he gets appointed not just for Celtic but for Scottish football for f- other Scottish football fans having a look at us as a football club and going why are you appointing that man why? especially the, the Offensive Behaviour Act took its massive toll on other certain clubs clubs like Motherwell who I've heard some horrendous stories from Motherwell fans regarding the the, how they were targeted under the Offensive Behaviour Act as well. Eh? So it's not a good look for Celtic and Scottish football whatsoever if Bernard, Bernard Higgins actually gets a role within within Celtic. We'll move, we'll move on and hopefully uh, just keep us up to date with whatever else is on because the board are annoying me now. I want to move on to some good stuff. I don't want to... I know. I didn't. I didn't want to get the pitchforks out and be out the car park with burning torches and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, Scott yeah. Howe says, "How was the state of Scottish football not on yesterday? There was a problem with Streamyard. Scott uh, Streamyard went down just before the broadcast was about to start." Uh, and and just, and sh- back sorry, Kim. Just on that, we're delighted to announce that we do have some new faces coming to the show as well. Um, so we've had a couple of new additions over the last couple of days and you'll be seeing them on the State of Scottish Football every night, 6 o'clock till 7, um, only on a state of mind. And they're not going to be pulling off a mask to reveal that it's Peter Law as Brian. No, no, so, we'll get away with that. So, <laughs> so, so uh, pointed out later on. Let's talk about stuff that's been really, really good over the last couple of days. Ange Postacoglu's press conference. It was brilliant. He was open and honest and... What he, the insight that he gave us to the man and to his philosophy and to his process shows that there's more layers to this than first met the eye. I must admit, I take back everything I perceived what Poster Coglu was about after I've seen this interview. There is more there than than just I want to play fancy football. And and basically, like 
report jumped out for me, Colin. You were there. You were representing Axon at the at the press conference. It was his, when he actually says, "You have to find meaning in winning because everybody wants to win." Mm. And I went, "Wow, this is this is an uh, this is a day after we lose Betty Old, who's part of the greatest ever fairy tale that any football club can ever can can ever look." can ever like want nobody can write the story of the Lisbon Lions and as a Celtic fan for me eh, I'm never going to back down for asking that we win in a certain way we represent certain values because that's our club and when Ange Postacoglu says that I went I get you you get me. You get you get where we want you, you get where, where we want to go and I'm never going to back down for back in Ange now because that find meaning in winning just says so much about his philosophy as him as a person and also as us as a football club. See, the, the press conferences in general, it was so enlightening because you saw a different side to Ange Postacoglu in that. You, you see him when he comes up against the sort of mainstream press and they'll say to him, oh, this was a disaster or what about this or what about that? And he, he's direct to them. He's straight to the point. He's like, uh, mate, Make this, make that, and he doesn't say it as if he's your mate. But when he was speaking to us at the the fan media conference, it was how's it going, mate? It was a uh, this is my idea, mate, and it, it was almost as if he was trying to take you on his journey with him. He wasn't just giving you the sort of basic, simple one word answer because there was certain questions that could have just had a one word answer. Uh, at, and that's not a, I dig at the questions because I thought every single question that was asked at that fan media conference was absolutely superb. But I think if the the mainstream press had added it, then he could have given a, a one word answer or a, a one sentence answer and he could have moved away from it. But the, the fact that he kind of took you and he gave you all his insights, even to the point of speaking about untapped markets and the fact that he's looking at the the South Korean market, the Iranian market, markets that people would have said that you're never going to get a player from there. But he's got that knowledge. He knows there from being out in that area. From That's the kind of markets he would have targeted whilst he was playing in the J-League. And he was asked a question, and there was a question asked about, would a Scottish Premier League player be a success in the J-League? Now, how is he going to know that? I mean, he's been here long enough, he can maybe tell what certain players are, but... You never know until, but he gave a good three, four minute answer on that, and he was open and honest, and it was so enlightening, Kev, that he picked the time out with everything that's going on at the football club at the minute to open up to the fans and to build that relationship with the fans. And I'll kind of I'll shut up in a second because I've been talking for ages, but he turned down and he says, and it's something that will stick with me. I haven't <coughs> earned. The, res- the reputation and the the kind of um, applause that I've received from the fans so far. I've done nothing to earn that, to deserve that. I'm going to go out on the park and I'm going to win trophies and I'm going to earn that respect in you. And, and you don't realise how much you've already put into this club. You're getting the backing that you do deserve because last season the club was a shambles. We were 25 points behind. This year we're putting in a title challenge and we've turned around a squad in the space of a couple of months. That is why you're getting the backing. If this is what it is now, just imagine what it would be like if you win the league at the end of the season. Um, yes. I mean, uh, he's, he's coming from a point, a professional point of view when he says, I didn't deserve this yet because I haven't achieved anything yet. We're right at the start. But let, let, let's let's appeal to the, the, the romantic fan and all ears in this room at this precise moment in time, when he says things like anything that we do will just be standing on the shoulders of giants and he gives us a Danny McGrain story as well <laughs> so <laughs> he, he never put a foot wrong in that press conference, Brian, did he? No, he was excellent and <laughs> last night I've been a, kind of a fan no, from when he was you know, linked with the job, but certainly the first a few press conferences, the way he went about his business, he seemed like he got it. And that just confirmed it. And, you know, I, I would get fired up about the bold and stuff earlier, but I'm getting fired up in a positive way now think about it because I was so energised and enthralled by the words he said. And it wasn't coming from a rehearsed place. It wasn't coming from, you know, you know, ticking a box and, oh, yeah, actually, 
you know, watch old Celtic videos at home and I've always been a Celtic fan. It wasn't any rubbish. He just gets it. If ever a man in a club were suited, it appears to be post the club going Celtic. When he was talking about being on the shoulders of giants, I thought that is excellently put. When he spoke about how the reason we're all here is because of the sacrifices everyone, fans, players, staff, have made over the years to build Celtic up. How lucky he was to be there, how determined he was to make it a success and how he would never take that for granted. I thought, brilliant, you get it, you get us. The other thing, speaking of the romance of it, is we are hopeless romantics, or hopeless at romance, one of the two. But the <laughs> fact of is, bit of both. <laughs> what he was talking about when he was talking about players when he says it's important to just be a decent human being. Just be a good human being. No matter your rich or poor, what your life's like, just be a decent human being. And that goes so far in bringing that into the job and into the players and into the type of culture he wants to foster and create. I think it's magnificent. And you've got to remember as well, we're only at the start. You know, we've said we've said for day one, you know, I, I think I say something like it's not about the next four months, but the next 40 months. Mm. We're still a long way away and he keeps saying we're nowhere near good enough. We're playing all right, but we're not good enough. He never wants to settle. He wants us to always improve because it's, he feels like if you're ex-Celtic, you have to always want to improve. You have to always want to get to the next level. You never want to get complacent. And I just wish other people at the club had a modicum of his qualities as a human being, as a manager, because for me, and I know it's only one press conference and people are going to say we're getting overexcited, but even the way he dealt with the Kyogo racism stuff, the way he's, he's dealt with, with Walter Smith passing, with Betty O passing, the way he's dealt with any challenge, the way he spoke to each players, it's been absolutely effortless. And, and I, I thought if there was ever any doubters about Ange, as a, as a man and as a manager, just watch that press conference through because he was excellent. Absolutely. And I've, I've got to say, Kevin, getting the chance to, to put a question to him, Everybody speaks about the, the kind of progress that we've made and the project that we're on. And I, I wanted to ask him about how he felt we were shaped going forward into phase two, um, both on and off the park. I know a lot of people say, well, well, off the park, this is where we need to improve in terms of squad. But off the park, we've, we've all spoken about the fact that he's, he's came in, he's had to inherit a, a backroom team. Now, back at the time, a lot of people were saying, well, he's got to be able to get the freedom to bring his own people in. He spoke about how everybody bought into his his ideas, and if they didn't buy into his ideas, they would have been gone. Mm-hmm. So that, that shows the kind of man that he is. And the, the interesting part, his answer that he gave me, was that the recruitment side of the team is what he's looking for is from now to whenever it may be. And when you look at it, we've spoke about it in depth on this channel about the idea of a director of football. That to me suggests that that's not ruled out. That if you're looking at a, a sort of um, technical director or director of football, that can fall under the recruitment banner. The fact that he's also looking at improving the scouting of it as well, that suggests to me all these things that people said, oh no, we're just kind of going to write this off, we're going to write it off. He's still got that in the back of his mind. And as, as Brian says, it's going to take a bit of time to put it in. We just have to get there. And he knows what his focus is. If the club continue to back him and he has the success that he's had in part one of this project, we could be in for a long-term success programme here at Celtic. One thing I want to say, Dave, just, sorry, Kev, just before you move on, um, just about the actual fan conference, I thought all the questions were excellent. I thought, mm-hmm. were. Colin, you smashed it. First question, big fella, set the tone. Cheers, mate. <laughs> um, but I think, I think, huge credit to everyone that was ans- that was asking the questions because they were professional, they were thorough, they were to the point. There was no, you know, nonsense. And I think it was a real credit to fan media being there. And I think it was criticised before in the mainstream media get themselves in a, a bit of a tizzy. But I thought that was an an excellently orchestrated press conference so as much credit has to go to the, the, the sort of contributors and the, the, the <clears throat> questioners I suppose as Ange so credit for credit straight to everyone It was it was impressive and he, he seemed like he wanted to be there he seemed like he was quite happy to be fielding questions from fans um, he, and he, what what some fans pundits 
um, in the media and also in farm media actually sometimes put across the it's maybe a lazy assumption that he didn't understand Celtic and he didn't understand the demands like that were going to get put on him as Celtic manager. And what this press conference actually says to me was he knew full well what is the what the demands were going to be. He knew full well that it had to be a short term and a longer term, but he was going to plan for both at the same time. But he knew full well that if his short term failed, his long term wasn't going to be there and he had to get results. But what he wasn't willing to do, he wasn't willing to jeopardise the long term for that short term. And uh, that sounded a bit convol- convoluted there, but I think it was just this, I, was it maybe an arrogance or a lack of knowledge from guys like myself on, on these shows who just thought, he's coming for Australia, he's not going to understand the big big European club mentality. I think he, he's, he proved in that in that uh, press conference that he knew full well what he was getting himself in for, uh, into. He knew the chaos he was getting himself into, and he all and he backed himself, Brian, to actually pull himself through. He always backed himself to do it. Ah, uh, and he kind of said that as much for the start, didn't he? he said this is only going to work if, if the players believe in me, and the staff believe in me, the club believe in me, and the fans believe. If they believe, I'll make it work for you, and I'll do it my way because it's been successful everywhere I've been. He's been successful at international level. He's got an international trophy under his belt. The most successful coach in Australia, coach in Japan, as we know. Um, you know the type of football he's played has been lauded by the likes of Brendan Rodgers, Pep Guardiola. He came with a, a, a pedigree. It's just it was an unusual pedigree, and I think it was as much as people always fear the unknown, right? Everyone in every walk of life and every circumstance fears the unknown. And given the fact we were hurting as a support from the shambles of last year. I think it'd have been easier to have a, you know, it's, it's like if, you're, if you've got a hangover and you're dying in your bed, all you want is a burger. You don't want a gourmet meal. You don't want something to put something in the oven. You want a hamburger or you want a Chinese or something terrible, right? We just wanted something that we would know and we would go, it's a safe bet to get the job done. What we got was a really risky appointment and I think that factored in. So I'm not sure if it was necessarily like arrogance. It was more of a fact we don't know this guy. Is this going to go well because we've been hurt in the past? And so far, I I, I, I know he's not won anything yet because there's nothing to be won yet. I know we're still second in the league, but I think he's done a, a better job than I would have expected um, at this stage, given the, the start he had. Definitely, and I think he has overachieved. And, and, and even though what he actually says was we've been inconsistent, he admits that he's inconsistent. Uh, he admits that he's been uh, the team's been inconsistent, but he also backs up that in- inconsistency, Colin. With well, these are the reasons for the inconsistencies, but they're no an excuse for it. But there's a, yeah. there is reasons there why we've been inconsistent and we've managed to get through it. At the moment, we are still four points behind, but we had a decent run there in the lap before the international break. And I reckon this international break came at a very, very good time for us. It gave Ange time to actually step back and go, right, what went right, what went wrong, and where are we going going forward? Now, for what, he, for what he's actually saying is this transfer window is going to be a bit of probably the same as the last transfer window. It'll be a mixture of players that it's already been identified by the scouting department and players that he knows that can come in and do that. But what he's identified is he needs a better structure behind. So mm-hmm. this is so so this is this is not the kind of way that we're going to do it going forward. And as bit by bit and I'm actually quite glad that the, the coaching staff have bought into it. Because it gives Poster Coglu time to focus on what needs done right away. Absolutely. Uh, and I think what you're seeing at the minute is it is Ange kind of running everything behind the scenes. He is the one that's identifying players, he's bringing players and he's kind of maybe putting it out to the, the team saying, look, go and look at this guy, go and look at that guy. I think what he does need though is he needs a team that he can trust behind him to do that so that he can focus on other things because he's doing that at the same time as developing players and you've saw what he can do with players so far this season how much he can bring their game on it's important that as a manager and as a a head coach of a football club that can be his prime focus yeah you want him to be involved in looking at the, the transfers coming in and out but as you say the results on the park will determine whether he's here for the short term or the long term 
So if he goes and wins the league and he brings the players on, that's exactly what you're looking for. If he's also got an insight into the Japanese, South Korean, Iranian market, whatever it is, that's important too. But he needs to say to whoever it is that he gets in there to work alongside him, you know what I'm looking at, you know what I want, you know the kind of players I'm looking for, go and take a look and come back to me. Instead of him having to say to the guys out there already just now, I know Maeda from the J-League, I know Hitati from the J-League, I know such and such from the A-League, what do you guys think of that? Can we go and get a deal done? The, he said it, and um, I, I've got to say, he was, he was very kind of complimentary to his family of that, is that he knew that as soon as he came over here for the first couple of months, his main focus was going to be on the, the club. He knew the job and he knew the kind of project that he had to take over. And his family had to come second to that because he was putting the amount of time into, into the club. Having that structure behind him, knowing that his family back him that, in that sense, that is so important because if he didn't have that, I don't even know if he'd have been able to take a job like this on. So it just shows you how much of a project Celtic was in the summer. And we're not there yet, but we've got the groundings of a very good structure. It's just about putting the building blocks in place. You're right, it's just the groundings and we're, we're seeing... It's very, it's very easy to be negative. It's very negative. It's very easy to go. Oh, we're no. We might not get at the Europa League group. We never got into the Champions League. This and that. But trying to be positive at this point. This is what a manager has to do. And I think myself, I always look for the positives and 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 this stuff as well, Brian. And one of the positives that I actually found from the from the press conference as well was the way that he actually spoke about the players. He, he bigged up the players. Going the way that I want to play is complicated. And I need players to buy into that. I need pl- players that are that are willing uh, that are willing to step up and be con- to think outside the box. Like I'm, what I'm going to do to ask them to do things that they've never been asked to do before. And he says that the players are bought into that. And I found that really quite quite refreshing as well. That he was willing, just like last week, when when he had his backroom staff in the photo for his Manager of the Month award, in this press conference, which was all about him, basically. He basically bigged up the players in the way that they've bought into what he wants to do because they're a massive part of it. <laughs> they are. A, if they didn't buy into it, his project fails. Absolutely. And, and I think he was very honest with some of the players as well. He was asked about you know, Ura Gideon, Liam Shaw and James McCarthy. And he was deflecting. He wasn't giving a, a, sort of a fluff answer. He was quite honest in that you know, we need to see where their careers lie, if they're going to go out and loan, or if they're going to get a shot at the first team, if they're going to be up to speed properly. But what he did say, which I thought was lovely, was everyone that plays under him will become a better player. Whether they're good enough to be in his team is is something that's in their own hands, but they will improve under him. They will improve at training. Um, And and I thought he, he... he handled that really well, and you're right about the, the players that we the put on him. You know, the much maligned Tony Ralston's a, an ideal example. Um, how the, the improvement in him, you know, regardless of where he sees level just now, the improvement from where he was is is sensational. It really is the improvement in Rogic. It, it's been it's, he looks like a different player. Even Cal McGregor, who was excellent in recent years, has really looked back to his absolute best. Um, Young Stephen Welsh, when he's come on, he's, he's looked solid. He looks like he's improved as well. There's improvement all over the, the park. And you can see that people are buying and enjoying the football. And as this, we, we alluded to earlier and we touched on, the type of people he wants at the club are the type of guys that will open up, that will buy in, that will roll their sleeves up, that will work hard, that won't have egos, that will get on board and, and merge with each other. And he was so, the way he spoke about Callum McGregor was, was exceptional as well. Um, about how influential he was and as you say Kevin was at pains to, to, to point out that he was such a good captain such an influence in the dressing room bringing people together you know getting them involved making them feel at home and and those characters and that's why we always talk about character and culture being so important you know that attitude's going to filter in and what he's going to have is eventually as much as he has it now is a team of players that want to be there that love playing there, that love his coaching and that are fighting for each other. And it's not going to happen overnight, but considering the difference in this squad of players in the short time, 
fantastic, great work so far. Comment here, uh, HICSC Technology. To me, Ange also seems to be performing a hybrid role of head coach and de facto director of football. He has been outstanding. I find it very difficult to argue with that, Colin. Yes, there's been a few bumps along the way, which you will admit. I mean, we are allowed to draw games of football every now and again. We will actually lose games of football every now and again. Not everything's not everything's going to be perfect. But when you when you see him talking about the twelve players that he brought in, and being open and honest about where those twelve players are in the process, like Liam Shaw and Uragide. He has, he's had, he's had a lot of plates to juggle. He has had a real lot of plates yeah. to juggle, and for him, for a guy who's trying to implement a system onto a team, but also try to handle what he sees as massive gaps in the background. I.e., he's came from, he's came from Yokohama, who have got access to the biggest scouting database in the world, in the city group, to come into Celtic where. I don't know what sort of database that they've got. Uh, got uh, It's not going to be on the city group's level. He spoke, uh, he, he, he spoke about the data, how scouting's completely different now from what it was in the past. The data, the analytical stuff, and that's where he wants Celtic to go. And he's got to he's got to sell that to he's got to sell that to the PLC. He's got to go to the PLC. By the way, instead of doing this, we need to do this, and that could cost them a player. I mean, let's, be, let, let's be brutally honest about that. That could cost them a player. It, but it's cost Celtic players down the line. The fact that we've looked at a, a kind of outdated scouting system. I mean, anybody can go and buy Y Scout right now. And that's what's used by millions of clubs all over the world to kind of identify players. That's where you can go and take a look. You can see a player's performance over the last 10 games. You can look at the stats. Kev, you can look at the heat maps. I know you'd be delighted at, at looking at them. I like, I like the heat map. <laughs> mad for a heat map. I, I, mad for a heat map, me. But uh, I think at Celtic, we've kind of got this whole, oh, we know a guy who's got a couple of players and we've done that before. Do you know what I mean? That's, I, I don't think it's exactly like that, but when you look at the kind of signing approach that we've made over the years, that does seem to be the route that we go down. Oh, we know... Jackie McNamara, he's the agent of Greg Taylor. We'll get that deal done. Oh, we know. Um, I've totally forgotten the Israeli boy. Dudu uh, do Dahan. Do, aye, that one. Dudu do Dahan. <laughs> we know Dudu. He's got his these guys before. Who else is on his list? That kind of seemed to be the way that we were going there. But I think now when you look at it, it, it is sort of similar to the fact that Ange knows guys. Uh, he knows guys for the J-League, he knows guys for the K-League, he knows guys for whatever. But he is right in saying that that only works so far and he does have to improve his recruitment team and he does have to improve his scouting team. And as you said, Kevin, if that does mean that the cost of implementing that is that you miss out a player, that's a short-term pain for a long-term gain because down the line, we're going to be in a situation once again where we are going to have to rebuild a team because that's just the way things go. You get teams that last five, six seasons and then you've got to rebuild them. But it's all about putting in future planning. And at Celtic, that has not been there. It's got to the point where this season we've brought in a right back. And it turns out we've had Lustig's long-term replacement at the club for years. We just didn't <laughs> know about it. But you're, you're only now signing a permanent right back who is or was looked at as... Mikael Lustig's replacement and they left the club three years ago. There mm-hmm. is no future planning. What happens if Kyogo takes a long-term injury? What if he's out for the season? Are you going to go with Yakimatis up front? Are you going to go with Ayeti? There isn't that long-term replacement in there. If Jota gets injured on the left-hand side, who do you turn to? That is why he's saying that both things are the focus for January. It's not just getting the players in, but it's getting the recruitment side perfectly aligned with what he wants it to be so that he can say well do you know what we missed out on target A but I know target B is right there and that's the kind of guy that I'm interested in as well let's bring him in instead instead of this three and four week gap in between transfers because we've lost out on our main target There's another way of looking at it Brian if we had a, if we had this scouting network and we had an up to date spent money on it then we wouldn't be signing guys like Bio 
we wouldn't have wasted money on guys like Barrio and Kamala because the scouting system would be like, no, wait a minute. These are guys that know to do this job. We know somebody better to do to do this job. Eh? So it works, but it does actually work both ways. But then that's up to Ange to sell that to the PLC. I think it's it, <clears throat> Celtic have had it's it's a case of idea versus execution because the idea was we get players that are you know a lot of potential. We get them into the club. We play them. We send them on for a big profit. That was the, that was the the idea. The problem was the execution. Of that was. Peter Law's grandson opens up a pack one ultimate team and suddenly starts look good and they sign him, right? There was no real thought behind it. It, it was a kind of, as I referred to the Argos catalogue, or, or like Asda, if you did online shopping, if you don't get the right one, somebody just sends you a random replacement. So it seemed like they were signing like young players with potential with no thought of how they're going to fit into the team. But look at Kyogo, for example. If we're trying to sign the Nick Kyogo, it's no a striker that's going to simply score goals we need or a young striker. We need someone that's get that sort of movement that cleverness, that that type of pace. So it's like modes of players we have to be looking at as well. And I think the recruitment then, if you know the type the, the of player, how they play and how they fit into the way Celtic play, it makes things a lot easier moving forward. And as Colin says, it helps future planning because that's how I spoke about before on here. That's the clubs like Leipzig, uh, Dolzburg, Munich, Brentford. They've got that sustainability because the players are it's a certain type of player they get with a certain type of analytics that they know is going to do a job for the team see the, the thing is when you look at it right you had Moussa Dembele and you had Odson Edward now you had Odson Edward coming through because we knew Moussa Dembele was going to make that big move he was the guy that was coming through Edward was seen as a very similar type player who could make a similar impact then you had Edward with Griffiths alongside him and Griffiths tailed off but you, you mentioned the guys that we brought in there, Kev. Bio, Klamala, were they ever, did they ever even show the potential that they could get to the level of what Odson Edward was when he first came to Celtic Park? Because that's the guy you're trying to replace. And whilst Neil Lennon was in charge of the club, the style of football wasn't going to change. What Ange just brought in is a complete different style of football. And Kyogo suits that style. So when you have Edward moving to Crystal Palace, they changed the style completely to bring and suit the game around Kyogo. Maybe Klamala, maybe Bayo would have suited that as well. But Ange knew the guy that would have suited it. He scored the goals in the J-League, he's got that behind him, and he's made the bid to bring him in. Now going forward, what we're looking at is if we're going to keep that style of football, the next striker to come in has to be in the mould of a Kyogo. And that's why Mieda seems to be the guy that he's targeting. I'm going to bring in Kenny here. Disagree, Kev. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paulus Paddy would have been the perfect striker when the, when working under Ange. I was harsh on Kamala, but because it's what Colin says, Brian, eh, he never really got the chance. He, he, had a, he had a couple of games here and there, was, fro- was thrown on in desperate situations. And it's really difficult to actually judge a guy on what happened last season. It is really difficult because the place was in such a med- mess. But once again, whether it was out with the manager's hands or not, the, the manager it was then's hands or not, the board have got an offer and decided to get rid of the player. They've de- someday the club's decided this guy has no long term future at Celtic. We're taking the money and running here. Uh, I mean, well, it could have been the case maybe Kamala's, Kamala's agent has said, Look, this is going to be a better move for you. You're not playing here. So it could, it could have been sort of both parties. Um, but yeah, hindsight's brilliant in it because you look at Laxalt who's much maligned under Neil Lennon, he'd have probably been brilliant under Postacoglu. You know, with that inverted fullback, the way he bombed, he'd have sort of suited that really, really well. It just didn't work. So, you know, as Colin says, if you've got, a, and the thing about it is under Neil Lennon, there was no style under Neil Lennon. You know, and I know being revisionist, that there wasn't, he, he sort of goes, this is information, I trust the players, it's all about the players, just go out and win, because that's what happened to him when he played. And just about tactics, about coaching, about systems, about you know how players move, where they should be. And the, I think the modern day player requires that. So at least what we have now is, it's calling and alluded to, a real strong indication of how we need to play, the type of players we need to play to fit that. So yeah, guys that like Kamala might have done really well, we will never know. It's we'll a sad never, reality. We'll, we'll never know. know. And we just have to hope that, it's, 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 he's both said, 
we plan more for the future now and we get players in we know it's to replace an existing player we know it's to replace uh, an existing style of player and if we do that it almost doesn't matter who comes and goes because essentially you're going to get the same mould and they won't have to try and fit in De- definitely, Colin. And um, we're now 55 minutes in, and this claxon's going to go off. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a Brendan Rogers claxon. No, here we go. Bring it, bring it here. Um, basically, we're now selling a vision and a philosophy on how we play. We're not selling, we're also selling the club, but we're, we're selling, by the way, this is how we're going to play football. And I know for a fact that Josip Juranovic has also says that he signed after talking to Postacoglu and Postacoglu saying, this is the way that we're going to be playing football. We're not. We're no longer selling a move to a bigger league. We're actually selling a philosophy and a way to football. And that'll attract the right players. Eh? Absolutely. And that's what you're looking for is players who look at the club, see the way that the structure's going and say, I want to be part of that. Whether it's for the love of how the football's been played or whether they think it's the best thing for their career development. If we can attract players like that, you're going to attract a better quality of player and that can only be a good thing for us in time. You look at the Ajax model. Ajax bring in players who have got an emotional attachment, guys like Dusan Tadic and Daily Blind. They're quality, quality footballers. But they also bring through some really good young talent, knowing that if they make a stage at Ajax, they'll go on and they'll get a move to the Premier League. And it's a way of attracting players in. We had that for a while, and then we lost our way. I think we have this kind of new implementation goes back to that. Mm. It, it does, eh? Now, we're, uh, Ken Colin, you've got you've got to be somewhere in a, in a couple of minutes as well. The last thing Poster Coglu says was. We're working up. We're working up the periods, and the best period of this season has got to be the last period of this season. Did you know punch the air when he actually says that? As if to go, <laughs> I could picture Rocky running running up these steps at Philadelphia and getting to the, getting to the top of it, going, "You've not seen nothing yet. Wait to be getting to the running of the season." And I, I thought that was great. I, I thought that was really really good. He was really really open. But what he actually says, where the best period has to be the last period of the season. Well, he made the drawing point as well, didn't he? When the, <clears throat> the interviewer asked him a couple of weeks ago, or oh, if you win the day, you could go f- a point clear at the top of the table. And he says, oh, do you get a prize for that? He says, eh, I don't know, we won the league in October. And he's just brilliant because he knows and he, he's... What I like, and seeing post called Blue says things like that, and I'm a UK, if I was, I was you know, high-fiving strangers in the street doing car moves <laughs> down, <laughs> down the Barrowlands, it was, it was brilliant to hear because you know he means it. It's no BS, it's no you get attention, it's no rabble rousing. He knows as you get towards the end, the longer he's with the players and the longer they're together, the more things are going to get better. And if that happens towards the end of the season, they're running strong, it can only be a good thing. And the thing about it is, that rolls on to next year, right? Because if he's getting better and better and better, next year that's going to continue. As long as there's progress, you're on the right track. Right, Colin, here's a question. The question to Bafi is here. If... Poster Coglu doesn't win the league this season. Do you think what he says this week with his plans for the long-term future means that he's going to get another season? Call. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brian? Yeah, 100%. It would 100%. be... 100%. That, that big. Him not getting another season would be worse than Bernard Higgins coming in. I'll tell you that. I think, uh, I think it's essentially it's at least, at least one more season. At least. So Kev, just before we wrap up, do you want some updates from the AGM? Yes. The question and answer session. As long as they're not going to annoy me. Ah, oh, they will. Don't worry. Um, question on why they renew the old firm trademark. They said that the cost is low and the renewal is to retain control of the brand and not to use it. Uh, I'm sure we'll speak about that on tomorrow's show. Uh, financial fair play in Scotland. There is no financial fair play, according to Ian Bankier, who is taking a bit of a bruising at this. Uh, but one really important thing that came out of it is on the scouting. And Michael Nicholson says there's a network with a plan working six to 24 months ahead, along with Andrew building a football division for the long term. We've just appointed a head of sports science and we are recruiting a head of data. People talk about the director of football, head of football division, and we're working with Ange to get it right. So that kind of follows on from the point that he was kind of alluding to yesterday, and I think we should be excited at the prospect of potentially bringing in a brand new recruitment team at Celtic. 
I think there's a lot that was quite positive towards the end there at the start. Yeah, it's not positive whatsoever, but I expect nothing <laughs> else from Mr. Bank here. I just want to thank everybody for watching and commenting. Um, plenty of more on the State of Mind channel. We've got a fantastic session with Gaz Whelan for the Happy Mondays. Go and check that out. It's a great interview as well. The State of Scottish Football is back tonight at six o'clock. Give, give the guys a give the guys a bit of a check out as well tonight. A lot more on our state of mind. We'll be back tomorrow at half past 12. I think I'm back tomorrow with Paul and somebody else. I, think, I don't know who the other special guest is tomorrow, but I'm back tomorrow. So thanks very, thanks very much, lads, and hail, hail.